Hey, podcast people. This is kind of a re-upload and relaunch of my podcast. It's dangerous. Um, hopefully you guys enjoy it. This is Charles J. Pratt and me talking. There's actually two intros. This is the first intro. There's going to be another intro. Sorry about that. But I hope everybody enjoys the podcast and you guys all have fun. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Do you want to make a podcast? Everybody wants to make a podcast. How do you make a podcast? How do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps? You want to be on Stitcher. You want to be on Apple Podcasts. You want to be on Google Podcasts. You want to be everywhere. How do I do it? How do I get sponsors? The answer to all those questions is an anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's free. Totally free. Easy to use. And you can get sponsors through it. Advertisers. You get paid. Right away. That's what I'm doing right now by reading you this ad. Go ahead and check it out. It's super easy to use. I highly recommend Anchor. I'm using it right now. I'm recording this ad with it. It's awesome. Go to anchor.fm slash start to join. That's anchor.fm slash start. And you can be a podcaster too. I can't wait to hear your podcast. Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to the first episode of It's Dangerous, a podcast about games. This month, I had the opportunity to speak with Charles J. Pratt. He's a professor of game studies at NYU Game Center, a freelance game designer, and host of Another Castle. We discussed his thoughts on ludology versus narratology, and what the future of games might look like. It was really fun for me to record, and I hope you'll have just as much fun listening. Thank you. So how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Like I said, uh, I've been uh, been practicing. I had a tournament. I was running a tournament on Friday, and then I practiced for about six or seven hours yesterday. So I'm uh, I'm pretty beat here on on Sunday Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. So how do you want to do this? I guess I could just introduce you. That's usually the way it goes. So you're yeah. the host of Another Castle, which inspired me to do this podcast. Which you know. Uh, you teach game studies at NYU Game Center, and you're a freelance game designer. Um, so what's I, what I really wanted to know is, like, what's your story? How did you get to be, you know, a professor at NYU Game Center, and where did that come from? Where What inspired you? Oh, well, I mean, uh, it was kind of a weird journey. I, I don't uh, – I, I ended up finding a path to the academy that I think not, uh, not a lot of other people uh, have – tread um you know games are a very new field so there's a lot of uh, there were a lot of opportunities especially when i was getting into it to sort of find your way in through uh, unique uh unique and different ways basically i was uh i went to grad school here in new york at uh the Inter- interactive telecommunications program at nyu uh that's where i met uh my friend frank lance uh, who's now the chair of the department um after i graduated i worked uh in new york uh, as a freelance uh, designer uh, just around the city um, and uh, did a little teaching on the side, always sort of uh, had an interest in um, education about games in, in addition to design. I taught game studies courses. I co- taught game design courses. And then uh, when the uh, games that are first started being uh, developed at NYU, it was sort of this idea. They had this idea for a a basically a a program that would unite a lot of the different kinds of games related classes they had going on all over the university. Frank asked me uh, if I wanted to be involved and of course said yes. I thought it was a really interesting uh, challenge, right? I mean, we're still even now in the very early days of kind of a games education, like what should curriculums look like? What uh, are the students you're going to get? You know, what What is the work that's going to be produced once you have a generation of people who are, you know, really trained to be game designers? So those were all really fascinating questions that I wanted to 
have a, a hand in answering. So uh, I came on first as an adjunct, teaching a lot of, um, again, a kind of range of courses, game studies and, uh, and game design and uh, game history eventually. And uh, eventually they, 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 they took me on as a full-time arts professor, and that's how I got where I am today. Awesome. And what, what led you to do the, you know, another castle and how, what brought that on? Well, so, I mean, there was a time, I mean, I'm based in New York, obviously, and New York is not uh, one of the uh, hubs of the gaming world. I mean, it is a little bit more now, but when I was starting out, uh, I guess about 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, it was very small. You know, I mean, like you maybe had like little indie communities in some other cities, but the video game industry, as people conceived of it, was almost entirely a West Coast uh, and specifically California uh, based phenomenon. But there still were a lot of interesting, weird little things going on. Around that time, I was also involved in, uh, you know, kind of the first flowering of really interesting uh, video game blogging. So I had a, a blog that I edited with a few friends and wrote for called Game Design Advance, which is still around if anyone wants to check it out. Uh, they, we, a lot of old articles that people wrote years and years ago. But uh, myself, Frank Lance, uh, some of our colleagues here in New York. And so it kind of extended out of that, that I was just really interested in the conversations that were happening around games, because they were, seemed to be getting a lot more interesting. Uh, it seemed like there was this kind of collective decision that the way that we had been discussing games all through the time that I had grown up um, was, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but there were things that it was good and things that were bad about talking about, uh, th things that it was bad uh, about covering. And so uh, myself, uh, other folks like Wes Erdelac uh, and Simon Ferrari, who became my friends, but also, you know, this is the, uh, this is the kind of time that Lee Alexander came out of, um, fa uh, folks like uh, a lot of the folks that are involved with the Critical Distance uh, blog, which is still uh, doing really interesting work and collecting a lot of really interesting video game bloggers. That was all going on. And so the podcast was kind of, kind of an extension of that. It was uh, both my interest in this burgeoning kind of more intellectual conversation around games, but also being interested about who was making games in New York where I was and who was coming through New York in those days and, and getting a sense of, of who they were and what they cared about. Uh, and then, you know, it was also, there was, there was, there were mercenary reasons. I was starting out as a game designer and a freelancer and, uh, having a podcast was a great excuse to kind of meet everybody who was in the industry at that time and really talk to them and, and make sure they knew who I was. So, um, I don't, I think I ever really got a job directly out of <laughs> the, the <laughs> podcast, but it was great. You know, like it was, it was like, oh, at the end of doing that podcast for a couple of years, I knew everybody in New York. I don't, I mean... Now it's great because New York has grown so much. I don't know everybody anymore. Um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of really interesting stuff that I get to like just discover. But at the time it was so small, you could theoretically interview everyone who was interested in or working on games uh, in the mid aughts, uh, and that was kind of the project. I, I, you know, for me it was kind of amazing just because I had never heard anybody talk about games that way before, and approach them and each guest that you had on there had such a different idea of what they are and what they mean to people and the importance mm -hmm. of them and it, it, it kind of just threw me because i was i was kind of like this is a thing this is you know and this and then i looked at when it was all recorded it was 2012 and i'm like this was five years ago what's 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 you know why haven't i been part of this you know i've been playing video <laughs> games my whole life right like where where do i fall into this where like i i it's something that i enjoy and it's part of my life Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've always thought, like, maybe I could be a creator. Maybe I could do these things and be part of the conversation. And I think that's that's where I wanted to get more into thinking about games the right way and, mm -hmm. and kind of spreading that message and where games aren't this, you know, childish little thing that they can be, mm -hmm. but they're not that. They can be so much more. They can affect our lives. And I re recently was reading a book called uh, Reality is Broken by Jay McGonagall. Mm-hmm. And that really goes into that, like the importance of how we as a society can approach games and use them to our benefit. Mm. But on a bigger note, I want to talk to you about something you wrote recently um, called In the Shadow of the Hollow Deck. Mm. Yeah. Which 
I, you know, I found your article and then I went and read Ian's article mm-hmm. and, uh, I tend to agree with Ian on a lot of it. Mm. And I think when we talk about story and, and narrative and games, it's, I, I, I don't know how to approach it because mm-hmm. I, I don't know where our, our narrative games really games. Like that's, that's <laughs> my thing. Like it's. Right. Like, how do you, you're, you, you know, you make the argument, of course, that they are, you know, you're still playing something, but. Right. How, kind of go over, summarize your article, you know, in the Shadow Hollow deck and kind of how, how you feel about this argument and what's going on, this right. conversation. Well, well, it's interesting because a lot of that, you know, a lot of that article uh, comes out of. Really, kind of me going through the same process uh, that you're going through maybe right now, which is when I long before I went to grad school, um, I kind of decided that oh, I maybe video games are a thing that I can be involved with. Maybe, you know, I I, I think myself and and I've talked to other people who are sort of from my generation, and they have a little bit of the same phenomenon is that like you grew up, you know, I grew up playing. Nintendo uh, mostly and PlayStation games and say, you know, and like that, that was my, those were my examples of video games. And I wasn't much of a computer gamer. Um, although obviously I knew that that sort of thing existed, but you know, when I was growing up, video games and basically all games were like things that people somewhere else made, right. That like, it didn't feel like a, an industry that you could join a, a, a pursuit like, you know, you grow up thinking like, oh, if I really wanted to, I could be a filmmaker, right? Um, it wasn't until I was uh, in my uh, early 20s or maybe late teens that I was like, oh, I could be a game. But people have to make this, right? People mm-hmm. make these things. Do they make them in the United States? I mean, well, most of my favorite games are Japanese, and that may be part of why I thought like, oh, no, no, you, you don't really do this for a living. That's silly. Like, this is something that people in Japan make or Europe, right, uh, if you're a PC gamer. Um, and, uh, having that revelation that like, oh, I could be involved with this, I, you know, obviously I couldn't just start making video games. I mean, even that was a big, you know, before the mid to late aughts, there just weren't a lot of tools that is someone who wasn't really literate in computers or, or, you know, uh, computer science and engineering could like just start making games. So uh, what I had to do was research. <laughs> so like, I was like, all right, well, what are people saying about games? What what is what are the kind of controversies that are going? What are, what's the big discussion? And it, and it turned out that around that time, which was you know the early, the very early aughts, so 2000, 2001, 2002, the big controversy uh, and the kind of birth of game studies as a field, the, the baptism by fire, um, was this old, this debate, this debate about uh, games and stories. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, the, the kind of, now it's referred to as the kind of the, the Lodology versus narratology debate. And a, there were a lot of people involved with it, right? Like kind of at the periphery, a lot of names now that are, are incredibly important. People like Jesper Ewell, uh, Janet Murray, um, they were, they were involved. Everyone was like, there were all these articles and like, like that was happening as I decided like, oh, I want to figure out what's going on. So I could, I, I, I was lucky enough to see that stuff unfold in real time, right? To, uh, to observe all of those arguments happening. Um, and so it really shaped a lot of how I think about games. Uh, it was kind of the formative intellectual experience. Um, and, you know, at the time I was very much on the, the narratological side, right? I was a big booster of folks like Murray and Mary Laura Ryan and, uh, I guess Henry Jenkins was kind of considered on that side. Uh, you, you look at it back now, you look now, and it's like, oh, this is weird that all of these people were lumped in because they have very different ideas now, right? Like they're they're very um, separated by their interests. But at that time, when like the focal point was this, like, okay, ga- games are they the next kind of stage of storytelling, right? Are they a medium? that will continue the tradition of theater and film uh, or are they their own thing? Um, and they have these kinds of unique properties that, uh, that really, you know, need to be appreciated outside of whatever capacity they have to tell stories. You know, when, when that was the focal point, all of these people that like now when that debate is less important kind of drifted in different directions. 
Um, but I was on the narratological side. And then, uh, you know, I, I became very much more of a lodologist as I started studying design. Um, a lot of, you know, if you go back and you read Game Design Advance, a lot of that is me in kind of my most lithological phase. And now I'm, I'm really someplace, I would say, in the middle, um, if there is a middle. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's really where that article comes from. So in the shadow of the holodeck, right, is this response to Ian Bogost's article, uh, you know, Games Are Better Without Stories, which is kind of a sequel to his article, Games Are Better Without Characters. And, and my understanding of the case that uh, Ian's making is this idea that, like, look, I mean, games are a thing. Like, they're just here, right? We, might, we, we don't have to argue about, well, are they important? Are they not important? Like, they're just here. All right, let's deal yeah. with them. And if you really want to deal with them as they are, not as we would like them to be, if you want to just actually look at, you know, at, at the quality of storytelling – then what you would have to decide, right? What, what it seems like you'd have to realize is that, you know, with some very few exceptions, the quality of the stories that we're telling in games is just not that high, right? And 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 Ian is is you know I I think he'd be very honest about the fact that he's a bit of a, an elitist about this, right? That like you know his review of Gone Home, which many people think of as this like huge step forward, and in many ways it is a huge step forward for, you know, uh, the strategy and craft of presenting stories in games and what stories can be about. You know, for him, he was like, yeah, this is nice, but like this is the equivalent of a young adult novel, and if and if the greatest, if the greatest story that's ever been told in a video game is functionally a kind of very simplistic coming of age tale that is like literary, literarily on the, like on the kind of low end yeah. <laughs> um, of sophistication, then that's a problem, right? Like, like we, we need to grapple with that. And maybe that, that just tells us like, look, the games aren't good at this. Um, and I, don't entirely disagree with that. I mean, I think that that is, is a strong point. My article, my response was mostly, uh, you know, in the way that the internet has a kind of like weird, petty ecosystem, it was kind of a response to the responses to Ian, right? That like, I thought like, okay, all of the responses to Ian are this sort of like, well, you know what, we're just going to tell stories with games, dude, you got to deal with it, right? And it's like, well, that's not engaging with the point he's trying to make, right? Like he, he knows that. He knows we're going to keep doing that. What he's saying is maybe we should question why that is. Maybe we should really think about what does it mean to do that. And, and, and I just didn't see anyone actually engaging with that. And part of, I think, the reason that no one was engaging with that was because no one was catching on to the real kind of historical implications and references that Ian was making, right? That, like, for me, and I said this in my article, right, like, I think for a lot of people who, you know, like the Austin Walkers of the world who are really brilliant but didn't live through that, again, founding controversy of game studies where like Hamlet on the Holodeck is just one of the most important books in that conversation. They don't like they don't read the holodeck, him starting out his article talking about the holodeck and be like, oh, he is referencing this enormous controversy. Right. He's referencing this really old history and discussion and rivalry. And so my article is just saying, like, hey, if you're if you're rebutting Ian and not bringing up Janet Murray, then I think you're, you're just not you're not understanding where he's coming from. Right. You are missing his argument. So, like, you might be satisfying your own points, your own point of view. Um, but there's no actual conversation happening here. Right. Because he's saying one thing and you're saying another thing. And we're not at like, and that that's okay, right? Like you don't have to actually respond to Ian's argument. You can be talking to a different audience, but, but that that's kind of what I was saying, right? Is that like I just felt yeah. there's a lot that th th this was a deep article. There was a bunch of history in Ian's post that no one I think was really grappling with, and I just wanted to grapple with it because it's a really interesting history. Like that debate wasn't settled. Like he's he, and that's what I think one of the things that Ian says that I totally agree with is that. Uh, 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 one of the the subtext of Ian's article is that this this subject is not settled, even though everyone thinks it is. And the response to Ian was like, "No, it is. Stop asking." And I was like, "Well, no, that's 
that's just you're just declaring that, right? Like, yeah. you're not actually grappling with any of these problems that people brought up a decade ago, right? Um, that we're still we're still we're still working with. I think that's my my biggest, like, that's why I find it so interesting is that is that we keep doing that mm-hmm. with every with every little situation where there's already a paradigm, there's already you know we accept things the way they are, right? You you somebody says, hey guys, maybe we should start start looking at this a little bit differently, and then everybody's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, like hey, this this that's no, right. I like it. And and it bothers me because it just it just closes out the the discussion and and the, you know I I like I said I tend to side more on the ludology side like I I think for me games provide the best games for me provide ludo narrative where like I you know the stories that I tell to mm-hmm. other people from playing a game is a lot more rewarding to me um, just overall sure. And you know, I've I've played through so many story based games and Dragon Age and I can't go back and tell you, you know, what the hell happened in that game. Sure. But I, I can tell you the other night me and my friend were playing this battleground game and you know, we had a really awesome encounter in the house and you know, I ran into this door and he ran into it. I can you know, go break it down right afterwards and tell everybody like, Oh man, that was so much fun. Right. And that that's the kind of story I think games excel at telling those things if you're gonna if you're gonna be that person and say you know this conversation is you know games can tell stories and blah blah blah. you, you need to approach it from the way like games are good at some things games are not good and let's let's see what we can do with the tools that we have to make games like hmm. I'm, I mean, I think they're, they're so so my feeling about this, right? As someone who was a very strong lithologist type, right? That mm-hmm. that I, I think very much um, felt the way you do uh, at at certain points. Um, and I might go back there, right? Like you know, yeah. intellectual life is constantly shifting. Um, is this? I think that that's that that's a very classic. Like what you're describing is the very classic way in which games. Uh, tell stories, quote unquote, right? Is that like this is the way? Um, and I and I think our blindness, for the most part, about this way of games telling stories, or like our excitement at rediscovering it, is is this idea that um, it, it, is the problem we've always had, which is that we divorce video games from the rest of the history of games, mm-hmm. um, it, it, for whatever reason. I mean, I think for very complicated sociological reasons about who played video games when. Um, but like this, what you're describing is the classical way in which stories and games mix, right? That like if you opened a newspaper to the sports section, <laughs> right? Like this is the way that games tell stories, right? That like rivalries between two football clubs, right? And like what happened? And then like, oh, you know, people just now as we're talking, right? The kind of, uh, Rafael Nadal won the French Open, right? Like set the record, uh, this this record winning uh, streak of of winning uh, the French. Like Nadal has a story. People will like write biographies about him. People will talk about his career and how he grew as an athlete and his rivalry with Roger Federer. And like that will be narrativized, right? Um, and that's right. And people will talk about like you know their memories of seeing Nadal and Federer maybe in a certain match or, or watching Nadal win, uh, you know, the French Open, even when everyone feels like he should be too old, right? Uh, that's the other yeah. story that's going on, right? Is that like, you know, we're now at a point in tennis, weirdly, where <coughs> no one under 28 has won a, won a, won a grand, uh, won a, a big tournament, in, right? So, so like there's tons of stories going on, going around. And what you're describing, right, with uh, – sorry, did you say it was Battlefields or – Battlegrounds, yeah. Battlegrounds, right? What you're describing with Battlegrounds is, 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 again, like the normal way in which we have told stories uh, about games forever. Um, I think – I mean, for me, the very kind of very particular intellectual – like the very particular theoretical point that I usually want to push is that, like, okay, what we don't want to do is confuse post hoc narrativization – with the idea that the event itself is a narrative, right? I mean, I, I think that like one of the problems we get when we discuss narrative in games is that our 
and and I was guilty of this very much so uh, at a younger stage of my life, right? Is that we tend to, if you want games to be narrative, narrative itself is such a slippery term that that you will begin to widen the scope of the term narrative until it fits games. Yeah, that's true, right? <laughs> like, yeah. in some senses of the word narrative, games, all games are narrative. But in many senses, that like a, a, a the, the, but in the kind of traditional sense that like a nar- narrative is narrated, right? It is a recounting of a thing that has happened, either a real, a true thing or a fictional thing. Um, then like the event itself is not a narrative event, right? The, the narrativization of it is what creates it. So that's, that's a, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, right? But uh, what you're describing, yeah, is like the kind of classical way. I, I what I, uh, where I'm at right now is to say that, look, at, at fundamentally, this is not an argument about what games are or are, or are not, mm. right? Um, I think that what we have to shift away from is this kind of definitional argument, which is interesting. I love definitional arguments, and I have, I have a whole lecture uh, uh, online about what I actually think games are, what, what I, how, I, how I define them. And I think that that should inform our understanding of the differences between games, uh, between a kind of classic model of a game and a kind of classic model of a narrative. But um, what we're really talking about is aesthetics, right? This is an aesthetic question. What makes a game beautiful to a person? What makes a game interesting? What makes a game ugly? And to you, right, and I think to me, still to a large extent, what makes a game beautiful is a game that produces these kinds of moments that we want to communicate to other people, right? That does actually produce stories, right? Like that we want to narrativize parts of these games and communicate them and what they meant to us, to other people. Games that do that are beautiful in a certain way. They're beautiful in a different way than, say, the way I, that I uh, enjoy The Last Guardian, right? The most recent Fumito Ueda game, which I think is a masterpiece and I, and I love. Um, that's not a game that, like, at any given moment, I'm going to, like, share a mo- like, oh, I did this and this and this. Because, like, yeah. you know, of course I did that. That's what you're supposed <laughs> to do. That's what you would do if you were playing that game, right? Like, But what I do want to talk about is kind of, like, you know – the, the history of this game uh, and how it was created, uh, the kind of vision and the uh, kind of unique aesthetic sensibility of its creator, um, the the idea of of a of an AI, right? Like the just just the aesthetic move of saying, oh, actually, what is most important in this game is that we're going to create a kind of classic puzzle game and then put a robot in there with you, and we're going to make that robot so kind of robust but not you know we can't do perfect ai so what we're gonna do is dress it up as an animal which we we don't think of as acting perfectly right right like there's so many great moves in that uh in the creation of that game and in playing it and there are a little a lot of really touching moments right um but that's going to be very different than the story i tell say about uh you know an overwatch game i played Mm -hmm. um but those are those are aesthetic questions i'm not making a statement about what games are i'm making a statement about what i find beautiful in games and what i find valuable if that makes sense (laughs) yeah no no, definitely i mean i totally understand that and you know that that alone has kind of gave me some insight so (laughs) yeah it's really good like um so i guess we're hitting my mark Let's see. I have some notes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. So I guess we'll just move on. Um, what do you? What kind of project projects are you working on now? If if any, anything big or? Oh man. Exciting? Well. <laughs> Uh, I wear a lot of hats uh, here at the Game Center, so I'm the director of uh, the No Quarter exhibition, uh, which every year we um, we commission four new games from independent game designers and artists to be played in a in a public social setting. Uh, we're gonna 
we're in the process. Uh, we've got our commissions for this fall. We're going to be putting on the show again this year. So I'm, I'm the director of that. Uh, I run uh, the kind of local, or I help run the kind of local Killer Queen scene here in New York. So Killer Queen is this 10-player arcade cabinet um, that uh, a kind of national scene or a national competitive scene for the game is growing right now, and I'm I'm trying to help that along. Uh, I'm the art director for our event series, so I've always got posters that I've develop, I'm developing. Uh, and right now, as, as uh, the kind of uh, game projects, uh, I'm working on a game called Foiled, uh, with uh, Bennett Foddy, uh, who uh, most people know uh, from his game Quop, uh, I think is his most mm-hmm. popular game. Uh, I guess GURP is also pretty good. People really like GURP. Um, and a young designer named uh, Gabe Kazilo. We're putting together a game called Foiled, uh, based on one of Gabe's designs. Uh, we'll be putting that into an arcade cabinet and putting it uh, out into the world pretty soon, hopefully by the end of the summer. Um, so that's kind of wrapping up. I'm working on a couple of little prototypes that might end up becoming my next uh, project in the fall or something like that. But those, those, you know, that's, there's a lot of little things. I wish, I kind of wish I had one big thing that I'm, I'm been working towards. But I'm, yeah, mostly just constantly switching hats. I think that's that's the life of an academic is you're you're always wearing a ton of different hats. The No Quarter exhibition is that is that just a is that kind of like an art as games thing or what is? No yeah, quarter. so no quarter comes out of again everything I've ever done is both idealistic and incredibly uh, mercenary. So <laughs> uh, at the beginning uh, of the game center, when we didn't really have any students, we had we don't we didn't have our MFA or a, or a, or our BFA program. Um, Frank Lance and I hatched this plan. Right, one we had this idea that we we thought, you know, video games used to be very social uh, social activities. Right, that like video games yeah. were things that you played in arc in an arcade, right? Um, uh, there wasn't this sense that video games were a thing that you played alone in your room. Um, and so we wanted to bring that kind of sensibility back uh, and to give opportunities to design in that space again, uh, because it was a space that we really enjoyed designing in. Um, and we, we got a sense that more and more people were interested in that space as well. So what we decided is uh, that we would have this show where we would uh, get uh, we would get um, indie de- game designers to design basically what we now think of as local multiplayer games, and we put them in a gallery setting. So it was also this like cute, like oh, our games art. Well, the last time, right? Like art is social, right? You yeah. you, know, you go out to galleries. It's it's a, so we would put it in like a gallery setting. We treat these things like art. But they would be like not the kind of art. They wouldn't be art games, right? Art okay. systems are kind of inside the classic model of like, oh, I'm going to sit alone at my computer, and I'm going to play this game, and I'm going to contemplate it. It's like, no, actually, these will be public, performative, arcade games in a sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that will be the kind of public art of it. Uh, so there was got you know there was a little, like a little kind of cute mis- mischievous like little poke at uh, art games which was like a you know a big movement um, when that was starting and then also again the mercenary thing of like we were a program we want people to know who we are so without students producing games we should just commission games and then people will hear about the game center because they'll they'll hear about all these cool games uh, that we produce so so our some of the games we commissioned have uh, gone on to uh, great success I think the most successful one is Nidhog which mm-hmm. was uh, a game that uh, we commissioned uh, very early uh, in the show and is now you know kind of uh, I, I think one of the most successful local multiplayer games yeah the sequel um, coming out too Yes, yeah. Mark right now is working on the sequel. So, you know, uh, that was the idea is that like, yeah, it's kind of like oh, it's, it's games or art, but not what you would expect art to be. It's not these like quiet contemplative things. It's like because the thing is, I mean, this is a whole other discussion, right? Like, <laughs> like of the very old arguments in games, there are what are games? What's the role of stories? Are games art? Right. These are the, these are the conversations that every generation just has. Uh, and has to find a new answer to. And our feeling about the conversation then, which was our game's art was mostly being dominated by folks like Jonathan Blow and uh, Tale of Tales uh, and folks like that, was that those people, uh, while producing really interesting and great work, had an idea about the art world that was very kind of outdated, 
in many ways, right? That like the art world was this kind of really wooly and like dangerous and weird place, right? That like the, the art world, the actual fine art world was trying to produce work that wasn't this very traditional, like, oh, I will produce a piece and then you will absorb it and you'll get the moral. Under-. It's like, no, the art, like if you produced something <laughs> like that for the fine art world, they would go like, this is crap. Right. Like meaning is bourgeois. Like, what the hell are you doing? Right. This like 19th century idea that like you're going to like tell me how you're you feel it like, oh, no, who cares? Right. One is something that like the person goes to and they're just like dumbstruck. Right. Um, the kind of feeling of the sublime. Um, and like we just we just felt like, OK, well, what does that? Well, what does that what feels most like? the kind of wild and woolly and slightly uncontrolled and like dangerous uh, way of making games as art is, are these games that are meant to be played in public around other people and that like that kind of design tradition. Um, And so out of that, we sort of gathered people like Mark Essen who was working on Nidhogg at the time, but also was featuring his work in actual fine art galleries, right? He was like being Mm -hmm. in the museum, right? Like no, you know, Jason Rohr is great, but like Jason Rohr was not a game designer that the fine art world was embracing. Mark Essen was the game designer that the fine art world was embracing. And so we just found like really weird experiment. And, and it's, you know, the, 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 uh, as local multiplayer has become more of an actual thing, uh, since the show started, uh, the vibe of no quarter has changed a lot. It is now mostly kind of like, Oh, here's a, a selection of really cool, uh, multiplayer games. And it has less of this, like, Oh, what can we do to upset the balance of video games and the conversation as it's happening? So it's changed awesome. a lot as every, yeah. as everything has over the last 10 years. Oh yeah. A lot has changed. Um, let's go with my last two questions. Sure. Any recent games that you've really, really, really enjoyed besides the last guardian? <laughs> yeah. Well, the last guardian was a long time coming. So, um, yeah, I, look, I mean, I play Killer Queen almost exclusively now. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm on a, I have my own team that I play with, so that's, you know, that's the game I enjoy the most and 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 regularly. I think of games that anyone can kind of play. I think I play, I played Near recently and really enjoyed that. Uh, I thought it was kind of an interesting, you know, almost a throwback. I'm always shocked um, at. The kind of games that you know the the say the Tumblr crowd will really embrace, like uh, you know, Near is this game that's just beloved by all of these all, all you know all of my kind of younger, more avant garde students. They love Near. They're like, oh, Yoko Turns. And like I play it, and I'm like, man, this is this is like serious, weird Japan style stuff that I was into when I was <laughs> like a teenager. Yeah. And it's so funny that it's that it's turned out to be kind of evergreen. I mean, like the you know a lot of the a lot of the surface stuff has changed, right? That like I don't I don't know about the Gothic Lolita stuff. I, I don't get it. That's mm-hmm. you know whatever. That's this generation's thing. But a lot of the like oh yeah, very purposefully weird, convoluted story. To, you know, like all of this stuff that like to me just reads like oh yeah, it's Evangelion all over again. Um, it's like, oh, it's cool. I'm glad people still dig that. To me, it feels kind of nostalgic and old school. But I, but people nowadays, I think, just think of it as like the people who grew up in the age of Halo think of it as like mind blowing and like yeah. out there and totally avant garde. And me, who grew up with like, you know, Final Fantasy VII and or, or the Final Fantasy games, or like, uh, you know, the Shinji Mikami, like it's like, oh yeah, this is back to that kind of weird anime pastiche which is great stuff i'm I'm glad it's so i I really liked that game i mean i'm also a big you know a big action game fan i've been playing the witcher recently and i think it may have defeated me (laughs) i think (laughs) it seems like a a, a great game and like really brilliant but it's just oh my god it's just so much oh it's so much it is so there's so much of that game um and i and i have like uh you know, and like, you know, it's talking about aesthetics, right? It's like I have an aesthetic appreciation for that. I have an aesthetic appreciation for this, like, Western RPG style, which is, like, almost encyclopedic. Like, we are going to put so much in this game that it will take you hundreds and hundreds of hours to just even, like, even absorb the content, much less reflect on it mm-hmm. and kind of explore it. 
it's like, no, you will just, it'll take you hundreds of hours even just to have read all the lore that we have in this game. And like, I kind of admire that. And I wonder, like, there are some people who like, you know, they're like biblical scholars. They go super deep, right? They're like, they can tell you everything about the Witcher universe. They can tell you everything about the Skyrim universe. And I just can't do it, right? Like, I can dip in and it's like, oh yeah, this is kind of fun. Like, I ride around on my horse and I slay some monsters and I get a haircut. And like, that's pretty good. And I know there's (laughs) a lot there. But man, like I'm like near is even near, which is a long game, but it's like, okay, I can complete that in a weekend or two. Like, and I can get the whole thing and I can kind of, okay, I, I've gotten all the content. Let me think about it. Let me read some interpretations. Like that's, that's much more my style. I might, I might be, I might be too old for the like hundred hour RPGs. <laughs> oh yeah. But, I mean, I've, I, I tried to go back to Witcher recently and then I, I couldn't last an hour in there. Just like, okay, this is, this is too much for me. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's because it's like, I mean, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, like, I think as much as everybody, I don't know, I sometimes get the feeling like everyone thinks that everything is awful. Uh, and that <laughs> might just be the internet. But I really do think that, you know, I don't know what games are going to look like 50 years from now. I mean, I have a theory that we're living in this weird time and that, like, I've written a little bit about, I guess I haven't written about this. Um, so I have this theory, uh, that I call the, the theory of the great crack up, which is that like, we're, li- we're living in this really strange time where only in this era will something like the Witcher be able to exist. That in 50 years and a hundred years, we'll have two things. We will have esports, like games, like really traditional <laughs> stuff like that. Like, you know, that, that we will have video games that are baseball. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we'll have. All of the things that I think are might descend from Gone Home, right, is like Mass Effect, but without any combat, right? You know, look, like all of this stuff right now where people feel like, oh, we need, I want, I have this story, I have this linear story I want to tell, but I also have to have gameplay, so I have to have like weapon customs, like uh, that'll just go away, right? That we will have, and, and I don't think it'll be called game. I don't think they'll be called games. They'll be yeah, called. That's what I was about to ask you. Is like, what are what are those called? <laughs> like, I, don't know. You, I mean, like, future generations that? will have to decide that. Um, and and I don't think that like video games as we know them will totally disappear. I mean, in the way that like, in the way that opera is still around, but it's a very very kind of exclusive small world. It's a very rich world, right? It's a very expensive world. It's kind of a luxury good in the arts, but it's small. Right. It's not it's not pop music. It's not it's not Marvel films. Right. These kind of very popular. Right. I think we might be heading towards that world someday. And The Witcher will feel bizarre. Right. People 50 years from now will play The Witcher and be like, ha, huh, yeah. Like in the way that like if we you know, if, if the average person goes and watches like, I don't know. Uh, Tristan und Isolde, right? Watches a Wagner opera and they're like, whoa, this is weird. Like, what? Why would you do? Like, why don't they just talk? Why do they have to <laughs> sing everything? Right? Uh, if you can't tell, opera is kind of my go to metaphor for video games. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that, like, we're going to think about The Witcher in that way in 50 years because what we'll have at that point are baseball and movies. Like, yeah. And, and those will be different because they are, are a computer and computers change the things that are on them. But we'll have this reversion. I predict we'll have this reversion to the mean where what we now think of as a, an art form where like the Witcher, the Witcher is standing somewhere in between Starcraft and Gone Home. Those will just separate. Those will just crack that the video game industry will crack, maybe not in half, but into some different pieces and we'll just have different names for all of these things. It's just a weird coincidence that we do all of this through the form of video games, quote unquote. Yeah, that, that's actually what I was thinking of. Is is when when even bringing up the whole Shadow of the Holodeck thing is that's what I was kind of getting at. Is, is there are two different things, but we don't have names for them. We don't have a. I guess there will be two different things. Is really the the whole end game. My last question for you. Mm-hmm. If I this is mostly for me personally sure if i have to read watch or play anything what would you recommend like one thing that you would really highly recommend for me to experience oh uh huh well that depends on what you want to get out of it uh it's, that's that's a very open-ended question i guess i guess about game design or about, about game, game studies in particular game studies okay well huh 
So I have, I, I, I'm going to cheat on this question a little bit. I think there are three books um, that, for me, are really important. Uh, and I would kind of recommend them to different people, uh, depending on where those people are kind of at and what they're interested in. Uh, the most important book about games and my favorite book about games, to me, uh, is uh, Johan Hoitzinger's Homo Ludens, uh, which has very little to do with game design. Uh, but as far as understanding games and really their place in society and as societies, which will make sense to you when you went, if you read the book, um, I just I just find that that book has been enormously influential to me and I think is so important. And um, people have not grappled with how weird and profound that book is. I mean, very few people have. Um, I, I kind of want to write about it soon, I think, because, it, it, yeah, so anyway. So that's Homo Ludens by uh, Johan Hoitzinger. Um, the second, which is I think of as almost a sequel to Homo Ludens, is a book by uh, Mackenzie Wark called Gamer Theory. And Gamer Theory is really, re really I think, putting forward a, a profound argument about the relationship that you ha we have to games in contemporary society. And I think it's a little bit less true now than it was when he wrote it, but it's still incredibly important. Um, and, and talking about what it means, like at the, at the heart of games, what it is that they are doing and what, what do we want out of them? Like, why, why are we doing this? You know, I mean, I think we very rarely ask that question, right? That like, what are games doing for us in general? Um, and I think he has a lot of interesting theories about what it means to live in the kind of world that we now have, that we find ourselves in, um, and, and and what games mean to people, um, and and how we should think about them. And, and specifically, and I think this is the most important thing, how we as gamers can think about the world, right? What is the perspective that someone who grew up playing games and being literate about games has on the world that might be different from someone who's whose primary uh, sort of forms of entertainment and art are the novel and film, uh, what does that change when your primary form of entertainment and art growing up was a game? How does that change your perspective about the world? And what maybe what does the world need from that perspective? So I think gamer theory is really important. Gamer theory, that's by Mackenzie Wark. And the third one, very recently from our friend Ian Bogost, uh, Play Anything, uh, I think is re also really, really profound, uh, and I and I agree with many, many things uh, in that book. Um, and uh, I disagree, and always have disagreed with Ian about certain things. Uh, but I, I I find his argument in that in that book really resonating with me and the and the perspective I have on games and what they are uh, and what they do for us uh, at this point. Uh, so those are three books I would recommend. Uh, as far as games you should play, I don't know. That's that's rough. I, I think, <laughs> I think, um, you know, you know, there's there's a canon uh, that we have at the game center. We don't call it a canon, but it's kind of a canon. Uh, we teach a game uh, a games course called uh, Games 101, which is our history course. Um, and so, if you're interested in uh, what we consider at the game center to be some of the most interesting and important games, it's not all of them. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to be literate in games at a very basic level, what should you play? What should you know about? That's, uh, you know, I would uh, Google around and find our syllabus for that. Or if you want the syllabus, you can email me. Right. And, and I would be like, yeah, start there. Just look on, look on that list and what haven't you played? What just by the name seems interesting and, and, and dive in. Awesome. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for me. Great. Let me... Uh... A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah, like, yeah that was, was a good one. Um, all right, let me just end this. All right. Thanks for listening. The track you're hearing right now is Useless Love by Steve Combs. And I'd just like to say thank you again to Charles Pratt for being on the show. Have fun, guys. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, if you guys have any suggestions on who else I should interview or 
If you have any leads on interviews, please let me know at It's Dangerous Pod on Twitter. That'd be a big help. Um, have fun, everybody. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.